Um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you. I am so uh, glad and I have the pleasure to be present among you here today. So um, today I'm going to talk about the special nutritional consideration in Parkinson's disease. So probably as you go, you probably have so many questions, but keep it until the end of the day, we're gonna have uh, um, you know, uh, uh, some kind of questions and answers in the end of the day. Um, so what is special nutritional consideration Parkinson's disease? Uh, there's so much going on and there's so much also research. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, there, we don't know the cause of Parkinson's disease. So when it comes to the nutrition, now about the use of nutritional supplement has almost doubled among the elderly population in the United States in the past decade. Nearly 40% of the patient with Parkinson's disease use some kind of vitamins, nutritional supplements, herbs, and many more use other complementary therapies. And the reason why, because they are seeking some relief from their symptoms. Some of them think taking those supplements improve and enhance their health status. Others follow probably some claims that some of those herbs or nutritional supplements may, um, may slow down the progression of their disease. Many of those patients, actually more than 50%, majority of them, don't even tell their health providers, like their physicians or their nutritionists, their intake of their nutritional, uh, nutritional supplements. And vast majority of PD patients, when they surveyed, they were unaware of the adverse side effects of those supplements. Therefore, a greater awareness of nutritional supplement use in PD is warranted to, um, to avoid the potentially harmful effect and the drug interactions. And we have to draw their attention, everybody's attention, that a healthy diet should be the foundation of the good health, not the supplements especially among PD patients. Now, when I'm talking about the healthy diet, what comes to your mind? How much? Okay. So probably for the past 19 years, you get used to the pyramid, the food pyramid, and my pyramid for the, la you know, for the last 19 years. So when healthy eating or a balanced diet, something came up, UCSDA, uh, came up with a new icon. And that is, anybody know? Just last year. My plate. All right, and actually it came last year and was unveiled by the First Lady Michelle Obama. It's a new icon and what happened that, you know, with the, our busy lives and um, lack of exercise, poor nutrition, I mean now we are uh, over 60% of the population uh, in this country are overweight or obesity. And of course, that will lead to many other diseases that are gonna cost the Medicare, you know, lots of money, uh, plus, you know, the poor health that we come up. So the plate actually, it's, a, it's, it's kind of geared to our life, the fast-paced lifestyle we live. And as a matter of fact, I, I like this one because, you know, you deal with so many people and patients, and you, when you tell them three ounces or third of a cup, or what's a quarter of oatmeal is difficult. One of it, it's just they don't have the time or the tools to do that. And this is, can apply also with the, with the children. So anybody is the visual thing. When you look at the plate, you know that 
those are really concentrated in four groups, as you see, the fruits and vegetables, the grains and the, uh, the protein. And those are the things that you need to have more often. And then next, the fifth one is the dairy, low-fat milk or, or yogurt. So if you look at this, um, you see the plates, fruit and vegetable, actually half of your plate at the meal time, it should be from fruit and vegetable, okay? And quarter, hopefully half of it, at least half of it, whole grain. And the lean protein. Well, how, and with the PD patients, I just wanted to mention that this is supposed to be your main meal. Even though we say you have to eat or it's preferable to eat more often. But among PD patients, I would say leave that for the main meals. Reason why, with L-DOPA, the medication used in the Parkinson's disease, uh, and the protein in the diet, there will be interaction, okay? So the protein in your diet interfere with the, with the, um, with the absorption and transportation of L-DOPA. Therefore, I would leave the snacks, uh, uh, snacks as low protein, no protein when you take your medication. So the balanced diet is really trying to consider to have, to enjoy your food and have a variety, a variety of food without overeating, smaller portion. You don't have to have, you know, can substitute with the juice and drink, uh, you know, the uh, fruity drinks with water, reduce your sodium intake. Now some of them, some of you probably gonna argue, well, some, some food are, are, are not there. For example, is that a bad food? <clears throat> Again, for so many years, and I'm actually many, many people probably have attended some kind of uh, weight management programs, and they kind of categorize the food as bad food and good food. And in reality, there's no good food and bad food. There is um, bad behavior and, and good behavior, eating behavior. So if it is not mentioned there, it means you have to take it in moderation. Things like, for example, somebody will argue probably like an alcohol, for example. So, um, the next, I'm, I have so many slides, so I'm going to move on. Um, <clears throat> I will come th to that in just a second. Now, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is degenerative disease of the central nervous system, resulting from the depletion of the dopamine, from dopamine producing cell in the region in the brain called substantia nigra. We don't know the cause of the disease. However, you know, there are, there may be some variety of genetic and environmental factors underlie the death of the brain cells. As a matter of fact, Emerged research implicates that perhaps oxidative stress, inflammation, dysfunctional mitochondria, a major contributor to, uh, to uh, neurodegeneration that we see in Parkinson's disease. So what is inflammation? It's a power, most powerful immune response in our body. So let's say your body got invaded by uh, germs, microbes, bacteria, um, some kind of irritant, maybe we have like an injurious tissue. What's gonna happen in our body? The body is trying to protect itself and defend itself. So the body will initiate a cascade of biological, of bio, uh, biological events Okay, to propagate and mature the immune system. And that includes our vascular system, immune system, uh, local uh, cells with this, within the injurious tissue. Why is that? Well, to attempt, to attempt to get rid, to remove this injurious stimuli, and also to up, uh, initiate the process of the healing. And that's called acute inflammation. It's in the short term, and it's a good thing, trying to protect our body from any kind of stimuli, right? But sometimes what happens, this inflammation 
can take longer than that. So probably will go for a few months and maybe a few years. And what that called? Called, what they call it, chronic inflammation. And when you, you start to have a chronic inflammation, then that is really bad news. Because what's happening there is a changing, a progressive change in the kind of the cells that are gonna be present at the injurious tissue. Most of them, they will be macrophages. And what are they? They are powerful defend, uh, defended uh, agents. Now I sound like a war. <laughs> defended agent, what they're trying to do? Produce, release toxins. Those toxins trying to get rid of the invading organism but also those kind of toxins also hurt our bodies and our tissue does damaging. So there will be a process of destruction healing, destruction healing. It's really bad news. And there's a production of, of, of oxygen, uh, um, you know, with the uh, oxygen uh, reactive um, and also uh, um, free radicals as well. So that's why we have, we say, destruction and healing, destruction and healing. So chronic inflammation is a bad thing. Acute inflammation is good, okay? Now, we come to the oxidation. Can somebody tell me what oxidation is? What happens if you eat, let's say, take a bite of, of an apple or a banana, and uh, maybe in half an hour you come to it, and an hour, what's happened to it? Brown. Gets, yeah, brown, right? All right, so that's oxidation. What happens if you leave your bike, if you have a bike or something metallic outside, and especially here in Florida with the humidity and rain? What's going to happen to it? Get rusty. And what's that called? Oxidation. So what's aging? It's oxidation. <laughs> and that's really what's happening in our body. It's a normal process. Oxidation is a normal uh, process uh, that's happening in our body. So this, this morning, we have a really delicious breakfast. So I was looking, there were um, some fruits and there were some pastries, really nice pastries. I didn't have one, I had a fruit. <laughs> you need one. <laughs> you need one. So, so why are we eating that? And you had a cup of coffee, why? Because we want to be alert, we need to have energy and we need to be you know, sitting here and doing our things. We need that energy, all right? So in order to produce that energy, also we are eating, we are breathing to get the oxygen in, okay? For that process, that's where the oxygenation is, is happening in our body, but we are producing something, the metabolism, we are producing energy that we need but also produce some uh, water and produce carbon dioxide, we excel. And there's something else is producing through that process. It's called, it's unstable molecules, and that's called the free radicals, right? And the free radicals is again a normal thing in our body. It's short-lived, it, only for a short time, but can do a damage. So what are these free radicals? Are molecules and they are unstable, become unstable because what happened? Electrons has been snatched away f from it because of the oxidation. So it become very unstable and restless. It's kind of, uh, when, I, when, when I read this, it's kind of remind me of a teenage boys, 15, 16, 17, you know? They're unstable, looking for stability and all this. So this is how they, they become. And what they do then, they go to the uh, uh, healthy molecules from our cells and try to take those electrons to be stabilized. And what happened, those molecules in the healthy t tissue become free radicals themselves because they become unstable. They need to stabilize and get the electrons and that's how the damage goes. But luckily, our body has a reservoirs of agents. What are those agents? Those agents come and they donate those electron, uh, electrons to those unstable molecules and without being them oxidized, without be them being uh, as a free radicals. And it stops, okay? So 
those agents that we have it in our body. So it's a normal process that's happening in our body. But the bad news are we are all, all of us getting older by the minute and maybe by the hour. And when we get older, what's happening? We are exposed to pollution, whether pollution, air pollution, pollution our food, pollution in the water, smoking, you know, the secondhand smoking, sunlight, um, you know, uh, medication, drugs, um, also poor diet, lack of exercise, lots of lifestyles, plus our genetic predisposition. So as time goes by, what happens? Those factors, environmental factors, actually produce more of those damaging molecules of free radicals, okay? So, we have more of these radicals, as, we, as you say, we're getting older and because of environmental things. So what happened to our reservoir that we have from the agents, those agents? What's going to happen? Do you see the imbalance? We're going to have more of? More of what? Exactly, free radicals and less of those agents. So when we have more of these radicals, can you imagine the damage that could happen in our body? Destruct more of the cells, and the cells lead to the tissues. Actually, the, then they, they, they destruct the cell wall of the cell, and then they get into mitochondria, the DNA, the protein, and that's why it's believed that perhaps the chronic inflammation is the root cause for so many chronic illness. So the Oxidative stress produce those free radicals. Inflammation produce those free radicals. So they go hand in hand. Okay? Now, what are those agents we were talking about in our body? Reservoir of those agents to counteract the, uh, the, the effect of those free radicals. Actually, they called Antioxidants. So those are antioxidants are we have them in our body. But also we can get them from the environment. Okay? I'm talking about mainly from food. Of course we have them in supplements, but mainly in, in, in food in nature. And there are so many of them. Vitamin C, E, A, CQ10, uh, zinc, copper, selenium, you name it. And those in nature, how they act, they act as synergically or additively. And that's why we get the benefit out of it. Again, in the nature, this is not in the supplements. Of course, we can get them in supplements, but in the nature, and that's how they act, okay? So we talk about the oxidative stress, inflammation. So what are we, and they go hand in hand. So if you have oxidation, oxidative stress, we said that to produce free radicals. Then when we have a free radicals, it's, it's making injury, right? So when we have injury, injured tissue, what's going to happen? That's going to draw attention of the body to or initiate inflammation. Inflammation then comes and then we have more free radicals. Can you see? So what are we going to do about this double whammy thing? Well, that's what it came, the idea of, uh, again, it's a pyramid, but they call it anti-inflammatory diet. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the anti-inflammatory diet. And um, actually, when I'm doing this, it's supposed to be nice things happening, but it's not happening. <coughs> All right, well, okay. So anti-inflammatory diet, again, basically we're trying to promote, and actually this one is not only used for Parkinson, but you can also use it for other conditions, because as we say, think that the, now the science think that chronic inflammation is the, the cause root for so many inflammatory diseases. And as you see again, just like similar to the my plate, what is the bottom here? Fruit and vegetables. With anti-inflammatory, try to get more things unprocessed, if possible, fresh fruit and vegetables. So we, you work yourself from the bottom to the top. Majority of your food is supposed to be from the vegetables and fruits. 
Next, it comes from the grains and whole grains, things like, um, let's say, uh, the cracked wheat or bulgur or wild rice, brown rice, um, lentil, uh, the uh, beans, and all this we have to kind of incorporate this in our diet. Talk about, talk about some good fat. We have to have a good fat. 30% of our diet should be from fat. Can't eliminate fat altogether. So 30% from a good fat, things like from nuts and seeds, um, healthy fat also coming from the, as you see here, we are lucky to be in Florida because we get all the grouper and salmon and you know the oily fish here. So that's a good to give you the, uh, the omega fatty acid because it's anti-inflammatory. Um, it get involved with, if I, I can talk about this for an hour, this pyramid, because it get involved with the structure of the cell wall in our body. Um, and then comes, you know, um, other things. It goes whole list of the things and even involve things like some herbs and some spices that they think it's, has, it has an antioxidant power uh, effect. Uh, supplements, I'm going to talk about this, but I'm, not, I'm going to draw it to here. Um, later on, talk about a little bit of alcohol thing. And you see also fiber. We're getting uh, so much fiber of here, in here. And one of non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease is constipation. All right? Plus, they're taking other medication may make it even worse. And that's why Following this is a, is a good idea because that's where you get in fiber. We need about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day with plenty of fluids, okay, with water, preferably water. Because if, if you take a tea and coffee, they are diuretic, so I really cannot consider them as a fluids. And then you end up with dehydration. Um, <clears throat> So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is talk about the oxidation and the, um, the double whammy thing. So as you see here, the first thing as we do in order to, um, to combat that the inflammation, we start from the diet. And this is the simplest, the easiest, the fastest way. Um, smoking can quit smoking, but try to be avoid also the secondhand smoking. Pollution, there's not much we can do about it, not at the present time. I think it takes uh, years if the lawmakers, you know, they have to do something about it. But we can control what we can control, and that's a start from with us. Um, so um, we don't know then the cause of, we don't know the cause of Parkinson's disease. But because we have the inflammation, and now we're talking about the antioxidants, and is it relevant to the treatment of the Parkinson's disease? At the moment, we do not have any drug in treatment Parkinson's disease to combat the oxidative, uh, oxidative stress through the antioxidants. However, uh, Silagilines, it's a drug used in the PD patient, it got some attention sometime, you know, it's used in the, among PD uh, patients. And what it does, it's actually slow down the breakdown of the neurotransmitter dopamine in, our, in the brain. And that by inhibiting the enzyme, which is uh, called monoamine oxidase, MAO. But uh, there was a, a large, uh, study, you know, um, for five years, data top, and uh, data top uh, actually wanted to examine the silicon drug if it does have any beneficial or neuroprotective effect, but they could not find that, and that was, um, you know, it was not found that it has a neuroprotective uh, 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 effect. And the reason why I kind of mention it, because I'm going to mention it later, the data top, uh, where they examine also the uh, vitamin E, um, benefit of vitamin E. So let's talk about some of these antioxidants. One of them is Q uh, coenzyme Q10, and I'm going to call it CQ10. So many people use it and use it for many conditions. But also PD patients, because they read and see so many claims about the CQ10. What is it? It's a substance present in our body. 
but also it's, it's also present in, in the nature and especially um, we found it in the organs of the animal. Things like liver, all the goodies, you know, liver, kidney, <laughs> heart, you know, you don't have to eat all of this. If you just go visit Scotland and you have haggis, it has all those ingredients. And if you don't know it's haggis, it really tastes well, nice. So, um, but also we get it from the supplements as well in a large amount. So CQ10 actually is present in the cell and exactly in the mitochondria. And what is mitochondria? Is the battery of the cell, is the powerhouse of the cell, produce energy. The cell needs to survive and has to get energy. And that's where the CQ10 present there. How is the mechanism? It's not known yet. It's kind of a mystery. But um, so uh, uh, there was a, a study suggest that perhaps the treatment, they found out that the treatment with 1,200 uh, milligram a day of CQ10, and that they compare it with another group, a placebo group, and another group which have less amount of the 1,200 milligram. And it's actually uh, it resulted in the improvement of their motor function. So there, then later on, a large trial, and this is trial was by NIH, okay? Uh, a respectful institute, they you know, bring all the study, and they found out that uh, they wanted to examine the, the, uh, the CQ10 and if they had any kind of neuroprotective uh, effect. But um, unfortunately, there was none. So by May 2011, last year, actually they stopped that trial. And now the scientists, they can move on and concentrate on other things more promising. Saying that, this study was only concentrated on the CQ10 in relation in PD patients, only in PD patients. So that should not reflect the possible value of the CQ10 among treatment of other conditions that we know. Okay? Next, also we need see that PD patients, they go to the health food stores and they reach for the green tea, okay? So what's the in the green tea? What's in the green tea that it's, you know, uh, promising? The caffeine. <laughs> well, actually, with the green tea, there are antioxidants. And uh, um, it's, it's a polyphenol in the green tea. And... Um, there was a study, and that study was in Japan. There was only one study in Japan. And uh, they found out it has some kind of effect, like a neuroprotective effect. But that study was in a, a mouse study, mouse model, and was not replicated again. However, at present, between the Chinese Health Ministry and the Michael Fox Foundation, and actually, in the, they're doing big study, a large study, to find the effect of the, um, uh, tea, uh, the green tea in relation to PD. And actually, the institute involved with that, it's uh, somewhere in uh, California, Sunnyvale. So we'll find out the result probably in a few years. What's the only thing about the green tea I want to say, actually, many people think, well, it's kind of maybe herbal tea and things, so we can drink as much as, you know, want. But actually, I need to warn you, it has caffeine. So it's a, a, a contained caffeine, so I would not, you know, take it later on in the day or before sleep. But until then, we'll find out about the green tea. The other thing here is ginger, okay? Um, we kind of hear a lot about the ginger, and it's kind of anti-inflammatory, and some people say it's good for the PD patient, but I tell you this, ginger is great for those people if they have a seasickness, or they wanna go on a cruise and have seasickness, <laughs> or per perhaps maybe they have nausea or vomiting, you know? Every medication, many people are sensitive to certain medication, and you would have nausea uh, with that, so ginger comes, it's a, it's a great uh, thing. Uh, you just cut, you know, uh, an inch of the root, Boil it for one minute and smear it for 30 minutes, and voila, it's a, it's a great cup of uh, ginger tea. And um, with ginger, there, there were also some, you know, um, 
they say there are agent in the root of the ginger. And um, actually it seems to have a protective uh, effect on dopamine uh, producing cell. But however, again, this study was done in the mouse model. So we don't have one in, in a human yet. And then next we'll go, that's very popular, I think everybody knows this, St. John's wort. It's herbal, a plant, and it, um, you, you find that in Asia, and especially in China, and, and you know, um, in China, and they grow this. And actually, it's a popular herb, or a plant, and uh, used very as for as used as antidepressant. And the pharmacologic of this plant actually works very similar to the prescription serotonin uh, uptake inhibitor. As a matter of fact, in Germany, they use they use St. John words as prescription for depression, mild to moderate depression. 300 milligram three times a day. So, what's what's in 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 Saint Wort, uh, uh, Saint John's Wort? Um, actually, there was uh, there is a a study uh, done, and they found out actually it has um, an agent in the plant itself, in the flowers, and also in the in the um, flowers, also in the leaves. And um, what happened, it seems have some kind of inhibition effect on the toxin MPTP, which is the cause for Parkinsonism. Some caution I have to say about St. John's wort. Um, if you're if, if for, for, it's good for a patient with a, a, a kind of moderate to kind of light depression, not for severe depression. And then if it is severe depression, then they have to take the uh, traditional medication for that. And if they are on cer certain medication for antidepressant, I wouldn't you know, um, advise you to take that because they're gonna reach the level of overdose. The other thing, it may interfere with the PD medications, especially the MAO inhibitors. So you have to be careful with that. The other thing, it has kind of uh, anti-clotting uh, effect. So um, again, if anybody taking blood thinners, like heparin or comedin, they really have to be very careful with that. The next thing is ginkgo, not ginseng, ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba, okay? And um, what it does actually, um, it is stimulate the circulation, blood flow and circulation to, you know, through, the, through our organs and tissue. So it was suggested perhaps taking those will improve the circulation to the brain and delivery of nutrients and the oxygen and may help also the delivery of L-DOPA to the brain. So that was a suggestion. It was not proven, but it was a suggestion. And, um, and they suggest probably 240 milligram, it might be helpful for the PD patients. But however, if you go anything 240 milligram and above, that will cause diarrhea. So you have to be careful with that. Um, caution have to be those people with the kind of, uh, uh, any kind of a, a diuretic, thiazide diuretic, they have to be careful because this elevate will increase the blood pressure. Also, it has some kind of blood thinning properties. You have to be careful. Um, and also may interact with the other PD medications and have adverse effects. So you have to be, again, uh, just because it's herbal, it's on the counter, doesn't mean it's okay to take it. Milk thistle. This is my favorite. Um, 
actually we start maybe by next month you're going to see so many of these in scotland over the hills and all that actually this flower is the history of it it's 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 a, it's a national flower in scotland and uh, there's just a little bit I'm going to say about story about this. It's, and it's everywhere, actually. When you turn on the TV, the national TV, the first thing that you will see that, um, rather than a flag. Uh, mugs, um, uh, uh, they knit, they did a lot of knitting, so you'll see that also uh, top in a city called Calendar. Um, and the, uh, the story of that is that, you know, the Vikings used to have a war between the Scottish and the Vikings. So Scottish had so many uh, envious and I suppose so many invaders in the history. And they sometimes they were the, from Italy, the Romans, and the Vikings a few times, and eventually they captured by the English, but and became part of UK. But the Vikings they wanted you know to get over in the, the Scotland. It's because of the high mountains and the, the the ocean. And in Scotland, especially west of Scotland, they have really a good weather in comparison where the Vikings came from. It's in the west, so they will get the currents from South America, and that will bring milder weather and temperature, and they're able to cultivate some, uh, uh, you know, um, some crops and other things. So what happened at night, uh, you know, the soldier wanted to surprise the Scottish, and it was during the night. And uh, one of the soldiers were, was, you know, bare feet, bare, bare feet, and then start to walk on, they couldn't see the, the milk thistle, and they step on it. And he cried out because of the pain. And that kind of uh, alert the Scottish. And they won the war, so that was the conclusion. Okay, um, so for 2000, over 2000 years, milk thistle actually used as detoxifier for the liver, okay? And a protection from, you know, um, uh, 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 people have like a problem with hepatitis and or alcoholism. Actually, there are study to show that it, it improve and regenerate the cells within the liver. So this has been going over two thousand of years. So how this related to PD? Well, some author suggested that a uh, physician author who wrote a book suggests, well, since the PD patients take so many medications. And where does it process? Where it metabolize all the medication drugs? Where it metabolize in our liver? So it makes sense to take the milk thistle to detoxify the um, the, the the liver. There is no long-term study to see the negative effect of it. Okay. Um, that's all I can say, but the author suggested if you take 300 milligram uh, a, a day of the milk thistle, uh, hopefully that will detoxify the liver. Anything to do with the neuroprotective, there's no such a thing, but it just to detoxify the liver. Again, you know, those are suggestions, and we don't have the study to uh, prove that. The uh, next thing is the vitamin E and C. Now, vitamin E and C, they are powerful antioxidants, and they are free radicals scavenger. So what's going on with the vitamin, uh, with the vitamin E? Um, there was a study earlier um, to show that, um, found that maybe perhaps the high dose of vitamin E and C, perhaps um, uh, it, it really delayed the uh, Take, take off the uh, PD medication up to maybe 2.5 years in the early stage. So then there was a study that I mentioned earlier, the data top. You know, the one which was investigating the medication, silicillin, want to also concentrate, well, pay attention to the vitamin E and to kind of try to find out the benefits out of it. As antioxidant, does it have any benefit? Uh, and the results actually were uh, negative. The vitamin E did not show any neuroprotective uh, effects among the PD patients. Okay, um, this, is, this is important to, to draw your attention to the vitamin E. And also, this study um, was confirmed by other trials, the same thing. The results were the same, that the vitamin E did not have the neuroprotective effect. 
But then later on also we have a study to show that um, actually the scientists saying that, well, uh, vitamin E rich food, okay, not the supplements, all right? The study was intake of supplements. They say here, no, the food rich in vitamin E uh, actually had kind of reduce, reduce the risk, oh, I have 15 minutes, reduce the risk of Parkinson. But the scientists were reluctant to say that vitamin E has a direct effect on the, uh, or has a neuroprotective effect. Instead, they said, well, actually, um, the, um, the intake of the, uh, vitamin, um, the uh, vitamin E in, 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 in the food were processed differently from the supplements. And actually, if you take a low dose of supplements, it's, it's okay, but not the high dose. So it's a controversial, and we cannot con uh, kind of have conclusive uh, results from that. But what my suggestion is really to be very careful from vitamin E. Just recently, just as recently, a big trial study where they involved 300, I think 335,000 uh, men over the age of 50. Uh, and in that study, after seven years, they gave them high dose of vitamin E. And they found out there is association, actually increased the risk, 17% uh, increased risk of uh, prostate cancer among male. Right? So I would be uh, careful. Um, and that's after seven years. So um, increased 17%. Uh, 17%. So, so much for that. The next thing is, I have to run quickly here, uh, vitamin B, uh, B12 and folate. It's known that B12 and folate are protective for the uh, nervous sense, uh, central nervous system as well as the nerves. It's good for also for your memory. And they found that a PD patient with the intake, with, you know, already have on medication, uh, there is something called uh, uh, homocysteine in our body. And working in the intensive care unit and CCU for a long time, anybody comes with elevated level, serum level or homocysteine, they kind of quickly try to do all the, uh, the uh, tests because they think probably the patients may have some kind of about to have stroke or heart attacks. And then later on came because stroke or heart attack, some kind of inflammation. But sometimes the, the results come negative, so it is inflammation somewhere it's going on in our body. So they found that the homocysteine level, it's high among the PD patient and, and those one who took the uh, L-DOPA. But we can get the homocysteine level down if we take requirements from B12 and the B6, okay? We said B12 and B6, what happened to them? They are good for our memory central nervous system. And, uh, but however, there might be some relationship with elevated homocysteine and also the memory loss. There may be association. So however, B12, B6, folate reduce the homocysteine and that should help with the stroke patient and to, uh, you know, to reduce the risk of the strokes, heart attacks, and maybe the memory. So, so much of that. The key point here, we have to understand that most of the herbs and supplements have been not studied, okay? Uh, so, as a safe or effective treatment in PD patients. And it's not strictly regulated. So, being in a counter, over the counter, but it's not regulated by FDA. Really to show your, to bring your attention that, again, the healthy diet should be the foundation for the good health, rather than to rely on the supplements. Because again, if you see it in the nature, they act as additively or synergically. In summary, it's important for people with a Parkinson to let their health provider, the physician, and their nutritionist know about their intake of the herbal and the supplements, vitamins, and nutritional supplements, or any dietary plan they are following, because 
any of these or compounds, they may interfere with your medication. I leave it to that, and thank you so much for your attention.